Okay. So hello everyone. Welcome to the NetPlate event this week. And this week we have Jack Ba from uh, Queen Mary University of London. And he's going to talk about investigating shocking events through temporal multilayer graph structure. Time is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so uh, let me just uh, uh, start. I, I will, um, the way I decided to uh, structure this uh, talk is to sort of go through uh, two use cases I've uh, faced uh, for uh, temporal multilayer graph structure. And uh, I will first of start uh, from uh, the introduction. As uh, I said, I'm Shrek. I'm at Queen Mary. Uh, but I previously did my PhD in uh, the University of Milan. Uh, during that time, I did uh, two visiting periods in Sirad and uh, uh, Queen Mary as well. And that uh, has led me to work uh, with the guys at uh, Raptory. Uh, so currently, that's uh, what I'm um, collaborating on as well. And now I find myself in this giant network of uh, universities. And the graphs, uh, this is a graph, of course, and uh, that's kind of what uh, I like to study. In general, we um, just a brief introduction for those that are not uh, in, uh, in the field. Just uh, we usually use graphs to map uh, different types of interactions. For example, we could have uh, an interaction between people, so like friendships or uh, uh, between accounts. Uh, bank accounts in the transaction networks or even in um, logistics networks, we can have this kind of connection uh, between airports. And the thing that uh, as I realized is that there is a lot of variety in the field and there are very models from simple networks, heterogeneous to multi-layer networks. And that's where the this is, will be the focus of this uh, uh, small uh, talk. Uh, there are various models, but uh, multilayer graphs allows us to study very complex uh, case studies. Um, in general, they can be used in many uh, uh, applications, and uh, there are different models and definitions all around uh, the, the, say, the, the literature. Um, what uh, is a critical step? It's uh, using or defining a methodology to map the data we have into a graph, and then based on what methodology we define or we describe, we can then model uh, the data to ask some questions, important questions. And the type of questions we can ask all are strongly dependent on the graph structure we are uh, obtaining. So a multi-layer graph uh, in general is, um, this is the definition I um, more often use. Um, we have uh, a set of entities, like for example, we can have uh, an airport or a central station in a mobility setting. Uh, this, they can be considered as the same entity. And then they are, there are different types of connections that uh, uh, connect uh, the places. Uh, so we uh, divide them using layers. And this is the sort of scenario we could have where uh, connections between uh, uh, airports are different from the connection between trains or between uh, bus stations. And now you have different uh, types of interactions or connections that you can discuss, not just inside of the same type, but also across different types of uh, layers. And um, we try to keep track of the uh, identity, or so the nodes that are the same entity through pillar links. These are, let's say, the key pieces or core pieces in the multi-layer graph uh, structure. And then on top of these, we have a further complication, which is time. Uh, it's often important to study uh, these systems in different time periods or over time. And there are different definitions as well, that are still depending on the context and the problem. So one could focus on, for example, a snapshot in a certain time or a in an interval of serving the data into an interval as a graph, or maybe one could be interested in how the network is uh, evolving or growing. So there is this sort of view starting from the start, uh, from the time, the initial time T0 up to a certain time uh, we're interested in. So there are different aspects in, 
is set in this sense. So just to summarize, this is what uh, um, I've been working on, and I will show you two case studies that are characterized by a shocking event. That's why we need both the, temp the, the temporal component and the multi-layer gloss. So we have these strong interactions. And we will have a financial network study and a social economic network uh, case study. Um, there are, of course, many more applications uh, uh, that uh, we can uh, work with, uh, from mobility to biological networks and so on. So uh, just uh, keep in mind that this model is general and flexible enough. So let's start with the financial systems. The way you can uh, discuss or uh, model uh, financial systems is usually we may have, for example, different institutions or account types, uh, or we may have more transaction types or different currencies, uh, which can be analyzed with uh, more complex models and so on. And now you can manage all these kind of uh, scenarios, uh, depending on the questions or the uh, focus or the problem you want to face. And uh, I will focus on the multilayer case here, where we could use this to compare different uh, uh, transactions or movements in different currencies. For example, I could use one layer for euro transactions and another layer for pounds transactions, or I could use these for banks uh, transfers and separate them from credit card transfers, or we could compare different cryptocurrencies, which is the case study I'm presenting you here. So in uh, particular, we were looking at, uh, um, at a, a system of stable coins. A stable coin is a, a cryptocurrency uh, that is uh, linked to dollars or other uh, normal currencies we are familiar with. And this allows them to be more stable. If you have heard, for example, in the news about Bitcoin, the price is always up and down. You never know how much exactly you are actually holding. Stable coins try to avoid that sort of uh, uh, shakiness, that uh, uh, chaotic behavior. And there are uh, there are many examples in the in the field. Uh, we were looking into the Terra Luna, Terra Luna ecosystem. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, this is a uh, stable coin system where uh, Terra was a stable coin uh, linked to dollars or euros. And then uh, there was a second currency, Luna, uh, um, that uh, was a normal cryptocurrency. These two currencies were uh, stabilized, uh, let's say, um, controlled by an algorithmic uh, process. Uh, and uh, there was a Bitcoin reserve also to guarantee as a collateral and to try and protect the, 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 the system. Uh, this was an interesting case because at its peak reached a huge value in dollars and there was a very uh, large confidence in the ecosystem. I like to have uh, this quote that summarizes, there was so much confidence in the system that the CEO was saying uh, sentences like this, 95% uh, of the cryptocurrency companies are going to die considering, let's say, the company, its company in the 5%. But lo and behold, uh, this is, was uh, happened literally five days after the same the, the that phrase uh, was uh, pronounced. Uh, you can see here in the graph uh, we have different prices of cryptocurrencies, and uh, blue in blue you can see Luna and the green line is Terra, and as you can see there was an incredible crash in their value. They lost all their value in an instant, whereas other stable coins in the ecosystem on Ethereum remain the stable, as you can see yeah. And the interesting thing here is this uh, has been uh, um, studied and um, we uh, uh, suspect it's been uh, an attack on the currency uh, by a uh, reduced number of individuals. So they, they sort of led to this crash um, uh, on purpose. Uh, so the, the way we studied, we wanted to study this uh, uh, case study uh, was through a data set uh, from the field of machine learning uh, that uh, was uh, describing the currency transactions in uh, Ethereum uh, of six currencies. And among them, you can find uh, Luna and Terra. 
uh, they have uh, different uh, informations, such as the source and the target of a certain uh, transaction. And uh, we have different attributes like the time, how much currency has been sent, and which type of currency, of course. And this uh, information is then can be used uh, to create uh, or be modeled as a temporal multilayer graph. So we have uh, each node here is uh, a wallet and you have a pillar link if uh, a user is active on both, let's say, uh, Luna and Terra. And now you can model these transfers uh, on each layer, separating them uh, used based on the currency. And you can keep track of, let's say, the, the amount of money that was spent as uh, weights over these links uh, in this uh, setting. We use this, uh, let's say, methodology, uh, relying on uh, pandas and uh, raftory, of course, to uh, load uh, our data, cleaning it, and then uh, uh, we proceed with the analysis using the Raftory library, which is the library for uh, temporal uh, network uh, analysis uh, that is being developed. So what you can see here is uh, an example of what we can uh, produce with this uh, uh, vision. We can uh, model each uh, currency as a layer, so we treat this as an individual graph, and we can create the graphs at each day. Uh, and uh, you can see here, these are the edges of the graph. And uh, you can see how during the crash period, which is highlighted here in the red uh, zone, uh, there is a answer, let's say a response to the crash uh, by the users that uh, end up uh, making more edges than the than user, which means that uh, users are basically trading with uh, uh, other, many other users, uh, uh, fine, which is... Uh, say the caused by this uh, rush to get off the currency as the value is uh, dropping. And uh, you can see here that uh, this interestingly also leads to uh, different uh, network metrics uh, like uh, density uh, to change during the crash. Uh, although it's interesting how they basically are able to, let's say the system reestablishes its network structure after the shocking event. So you can see in this setting how the temporal component is important, but also how separating layers, uh, using layers to separate information is uh, critical. And uh, another important anomaly we saw, and uh, that is specific, let's say, to a single layer, can be seen in this plot here, uh, where the green line is, again, uh, the Terra currency. Uh, and um, you can see how, uh, lighted here, these two, uh, peaks in the number of tokens that are being transferred over uh, uh, the day. There's basically these two particular days where uh, there are much more, many more tokens uh, transferred um, uh, compared to the other days uh, you can see are the normal days around. And this is something that it precedes the actual crash and not uh, during the crash. Um, during the crash, there's also, of course, an increase in uh, the total tokens transferred, but it's not, uh, let's say, comparable in its sense. So the thing that we were interested in was, can we gain some insight on this? Can uh, we locate if uh, we are responsible for these kind of uh, movements? And the methodology was to create basically the distribution of those sales. That, uh, uh, the anomalous days and also over the normal days. So you can see here we highlighted, highlighted the uh, anomalous days and you can see how the small bars here represent the movements made by a certain account. And you can see how the five users essentially account uh, for most of the, the, the movements. And you can see the same behavior here on the second peak, whereas uh, in the normal days, like bar one, three, and five, uh, there is uh, uh, the top users account for only a portion of the transfers, whereas the tail or the rest of the account uh, of the network uh, is involved in the movements. Uh, so we can confidently say that uh, those peaks are uh, linked to only a few users that dominate the, the transfers. All right. So um, this is, uh, let's say, one of the use cases we saw and uh, uh, was more of an economic system. 
but the multi-layer uh, uh, graph structure in general is interesting to use when there is a mix of both uh, social and economical transactions. So just to give you an idea, uh, what I mean with uh, social interactions is, whereas in, um, in terms of uh, nodes or uh, uh, account types, we may have uh, verified users, VIPs, maybe special influencers or politicians. So we are uh, familiar uh, with this kind of uh, setting in our day-to-day -day life, if you use social media in any form. And similarly, the activities that can be performed in a social setting are quite different. Where you can follow someone else or you can like his content. Maybe you can comment a certain post. So there are different activity types that can be mapped. So um, one of the systems that we wanted to study uh, was a system where we had both an economic component and a social component. So the use case uh, is the, that we found was this platform uh, called the Steemit, a blockchain online social network, which has both the, it's a social media platform like we are used to. Uh, so you have posts, uh, that can be commented, you can see here. And uh, it's not much different from, let's say, a Reddit or a other uh, social media platforms you may have already seen. And uh, the interesting thing here is that you can see a monetary value on the post. And this value is uh, determined by the uh, numbers of votes. Uh, so positive votes and negative votes. Basically, uh, users are then rewarded with this uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, for their contribution, and uh, they can move and transfer this uh, currency. So you can see there are many different uh, ways users can interact. So there's a strong heterogeneity in their interaction, and these are all stored in a blockchain. And uh, each time, uh, every, over time, these uh, interactions create these blocks. So you have these components, the time and the heterogeneity of the interactions. Then there is, was a shocking event. There was a strong disagreement on the platform. And this led to another, uh, the creation of another platform. You can see here, not too far off uh, in terms of aspect, but with the same characteristics. So now you have this very com uh, complex scenario where you have not only time and heterogeneous interactions, but also different platforms that are being uh, uh, involved. And that's why the temporal multi-graph was uh, useful in this case. As a problem, we focused on uh, user migration. So this idea of users deciding to leave a platform or another one. It's a problem we are seeing also in traditional social media platforms. You can think about uh, Twitter and uh, how users have been checking out threads or Mastodon. So it's not just something we find in blockchain, uh, but uh, it's... Um, very interesting uh, problem, uh, although it's uh, not easy to get data that accurate, uh, accurately describes these kind of settings. So there's limited work, and we went over to recover the data from both uh, Steam and Hive. Uh, the key thing here is uh, there are both social and financial actions that can be stored in the Steam blockchain and in the Hive blockchain. And we know um, the, 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 say, uh, the users that were active before the, the, the fork uh, are uh, reserved an account on both Steam and I. So now you can really track this user migration behavior. And um, the, you can see here some of the numbers on the platforms, not uh, uh, super critical detail. Uh, the key thing here is that uh, there's used that uh, huge amount of data uh, was mapped through and the model as a temporal multi layer graph with a heterogeneous link in the layer. So now let's say this is the platform Steam in uh, here. And we modeled, we separated social actions from financial actions. And you could sort of see their evolution over time this way. And then uh, we know that uh, users are also on Hive. So we can uh, make the same, uh, let's say, interaction network over Hive and keep it track of the identities or uh, uh, the entities with these pillar links over here. And so you can really go and analyze this structure over time, but also perform a predictive uh, prediction tasks. And um, one of the things we saw uh, in this work was how the fork influenced network structure. Basically, after the split, uh, you can see uh, um, 
different uh, network metrics and uh, how these uh, can really affect the, um, the, the community structure of the platform. And the second important thing was that after we looked at the network structure, we also performed a machine learning, uh, a machine learning uh, task of uh, predicting user migration. So the idea was to figure out whether we could uh, decide, um, sorry, predict the decision of the users based on their connection and network structure. If all my neighbors are leaving, I probably the, it's probable that I will uh, leave as well or maybe uh, not, right? So is it enough to predict this? Uh, the key idea was to label users based on their activity. So we created these labels. Um, if a user, um, let's say, uh, decided to remain on the, on the platform, so he was a resident or a migrant leaving, and uh, let's say the this state of uh, undecisiveness or uh, being active on both. And this information can then be, of course, modeled as a graph and you can perform uh, uh, predicting tasks, machine learning uh, predicting tasks by creating a embedding representation of the node or each uh, node in the, in the network. This representation can be traditional graph metrics uh, like page rank or uh, degree centralities, or they can be derived with uh, graph neural networks. Um, training these sort of supervised settings, um, we just saw how uh, indeed there was uh, the possibility of predicting the user migration decision, uh, both with traditional machine learning models and graph neural networks. And we could find like uh, some interesting insights of the features that are more, uh, let's say, linked or more predictive, like the clustering coefficient on the social side was important or the average neighbor degree. So these kind of measures that uh, um, um, were describing how much a node was uh, connected and embedded in the network, how much it was uh, really integrated in the community structure. Um, this is in general something that uh, we found in, and uh, in general there is uh, important uh, uh, work uh, that could be done in this uh, direction. So that's it. Um, the, um, I hope I convinced you that temporal multi networks are great and uh, how you need to be really careful about layers and uh, the time aspects in uh, this uh, setting. And we are working on various uh, future works and predicting uh, tasks, uh, uh, prediction tasks using Raftory and uh, a future machine learning module that is about to uh, be released. And we are open to apply this sort of uh, methodology to other data sets. So if you have any uh, idea, uh, feel free to contact me here and you can try the tool uh, by following this uh, QR code over here. Uh, yeah, that's it for my presentation. Is there uh, any question? Thank you, thank you for your talk. And uh, if anyone have questions, feel free to unmute yourself. Don't be shy. I I have a curiosity actually. I, I have muted myself, but actually I live mm -hmm. in Germany. Um, in the last. In the last work, where you compare the social interaction and the financial transaction, mm -hmm. the network were also weighted or? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a very, uh, very good question. So um, in, the, in, the, in the work, uh, we kept the, the weights uh, as uh, the, so the, if there were a repeated interaction, we would have them those as the weight. Right. Um, yeah, the, I th these uh, then these features can be they uh, uh, say they are reflected in uh, let's say um, if you make uh, how do you say it they will be useful uh, for uh, some of the metrics that one could derive in a link prediction setting for example so uh -huh. that, that that we keep them uh, in uh, let's say in play uh, however in since uh, the in this task in particular since it's more more of a 
it, it was a let's say node centric uh, task. Mm -hmm. We we did not really use them uh, let's say directly, although they the one of the features that I remember was the weighted degree. So in, in a sense, we were also not just the say degree, but also weighted degree. And so, uh, yeah, I guess they, they, they were involved, not directly, but it was important to keep track. So that's, that's a very good question too. Right, because you, if you do the not embedding and you use, for example, page rank or something, mm -hmm. uh, like their like page rank doesn't consider the, the weight of the, of the link, if I'm not wrong, depending on, well, mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, in this case, we were using the network X uh, page rank, and uh, we were not uh, like the the flight it, the flight version. I think don't doesn't use uh, the degrees. Right. Uh, so that's actually yeah, that's a very good point. That's why we also had like uh, uh, weighted uh, degree, although it's not the same. But trying to give different uh, signals to the neural network, and then uh, hopefully that's enough. Yeah. Thank you. So I have just a curiosity. Um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if in the uh, financial network, like transaction, you have like each user associated to a unique wallet or like Bitcoin, in which a user can be associated to multiple wallet and sending money to multiple wallet at the same time. No, oh, yeah. Uh... Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, in, um, in my, in, in, uh, let's say in these use cases, um, the, the way let's say that, for example, in the social um, Steam it, uh, your account your, uh, is associated to the wallet. Uh, so it's a one-to-one. -one. And um, the other case was Ethereum where there is more of a vision of the user linked to the wallet. Uh, so more of a one-to-one -one association as well. M a bit more uh, distant, let's say, from the Bitcoin vision, where it's more normal to have uh, multiple wallets and trying to hide, let's say, your activity that way. That said, that doesn't mean that a user cannot have multiple accounts. Uh, so <laughs> um, it would be actually interesting to then uh, uh, analyze the, potentially use those uh, clustering algorithms or uh, node, uh, let's say, wallet, um, uh, clustering uh, algorithms, uh, let's say, uh, in this setting to see if things change significantly. Although I, I, uh, I think this would not be too much uh, of a change, given of the, especially in the Steemit one, where it's really like uh, a social account uh, you have. So it tends to be that a user has one account uh, in uh, this setting. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And also, th this data is uh, open, like a um, open data as blockchain. Uh, yeah. So you can uh, for uh, which one? For, for the uh, social network you mentioned. Oh as yeah. A use uh, case. So uh, yes, you, there are um, you can there are APIs available to to access. I it's a bit of a pain. Uh, okay. Just as a warning. Uh, we are working on uh, releasing this version of the data set, but as you, you saw the numbers, it's a bit big mm -hmm. and we have still some uh, um, bureaucratic things to, to mm -hmm. go through. But uh, if you are interested, um, we can be in contact and uh, make sure uh, to, to share it in yeah, some way, shape or form. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if there's no more questions, then we can move to the second part of the discussion uh, about finding positions in academia. Yeah. So for this one, uh, um, I really have uh, mainly just uh, two, two, three slides uh, trying to uh, discuss what was my process? Uh, I skimmed over it, but basically, I am. Uh, I have just. I started a postdoc in November, so uh, this sort of question discussion was uh, um, prompted by how, uh, let's say, my 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 search for the next step after the PhD. So I think it could be useful for uh, uh, the people here, and also 
uh, let's say it's not over, right? As a postdoc, then you need to move through other positions. So it would be interesting to discuss these as well. Um, so just uh, what could be pointers or some personal notes. Uh, uh, I think conferences could, can be useful for this, of course, as you know, uh, uh, more and more people in your field, you could be aware of uh, some positions. Um, it, it, so uh, let's say as um, maybe as a earlier, so, um, early in the PhD, one could be more focused on, uh, let's say, attending every uh, every talk, every minute of it, and uh, you may remain uh, and may discard, let's say, the social part of the of the conference. But I think this is probably even the more important part. So, but you can also discuss uh, uh, this point. And I feel like one should really focus on uh, um, maybe going through uh, even schools, uh, summer schools, uh, um, training schools, and com local conferences as well, even if they may not be as prestigious, uh, they could be important. So even just attending, not necessarily being presenting, could open up uh, various uh, more. And in my personal case was how I found out about uh, the library and then I got interested and then I found out there was also uh, a position, so got started. And then I think also another uh, key uh, pointer uh, that could be that should be uh, discussed is uh, uh, the visiting, the visiting periods. Uh, I know it's not, uh, let's say, easy for uh, um, everyone in the sense that there may be some uh, limitations for uh, given by the, the type of, uh, let's say, position, PhD, uh, contract, or uh, uh, many reasons. But I believe I believe that if there is any sort of chance, it's a great uh, thing to do in this setting. Uh, not just because it gives you a chance to know new, know new people and uh, see new people, but also because it may be uh, a way to check out a potential future uh, spot. Uh, so if you're not sure whether you may like uh, working in a certain uh, town or a certain country, a visit a short visiting period could be a way to to do it without too much uh, pressure um and um i would say if uh, you go on a visiting the same thing applies in the sense that uh, when you are there is not just about uh, your work but should be the focus should be also on attending uh, local events uh, and uh, a lot of them especially in london for example are free, which is great. So just throwing, uh, or uh, um, there are also maybe sponsored or funded uh, tickets. So to not give up and uh, apply for those tickets, uh, uh, often uh, they, there, there is a possibility there. Uh, yeah, so this is mainly some of the notes I had on these. Uh, these are more, let's say, the mobility ones. Uh, Whereas the second thing uh, I wanted to maybe discuss was how to actually search for them. Uh, in the sense that uh, we may be tempted or uh, anxious and decide to move early. But one thing that I noticed is that most of these positions are very time constrained in the sense that they get out very uh, close to, let's say, the, the, they're opened uh, and um, very close to the, the deadline, let's say. So one, maybe if you move uh, six mo months prior to the end of your PhD, you find positions that uh, require you to start uh, very soon. So maybe you don't want to move too early and uh, uh, let's say, but at the same time, uh, um, don't want to move just right uh, uh, when you are done. Uh, as uh, the process still may require uh, a few months, so I would say three months prior could be a good sweet spot, but uh, uh, the parameter can be discussed. Uh, and yeah, I was in my search, I looked into not just, uh, let's say, uh, LinkedIn, um, in the sense that uh, some of the most uh, of the position I found were uh, 
random tweets uh, on X. Uh, so uh, this could be also working uh, for you. Um, and uh, it's a bit hard to go through all the universities' uh, open lists, uh, so it's a bit boring as well. Uh, it needs to be done, but uh, this was also a way to to find, especially just by searching the, actually the name of the field, surprisingly effective. And uh, finally, uh, uh, I thought that I found that uh, often. More often than not, it's about asking around. So all the things that we said previously, uh, I think, uh, apply now. As you are in conferences or on a visiting period, just discussing the fact that you are actually open uh, or searching or looking around uh, could be the way to uh, get uh, opposition. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, you know, yeah, sorry, it's the same. Yeah, I guess. Uh, these are just some uh, uh, pointers. I wonder what was uh, your opinion on these, and uh, we can also discuss. I'm open to, I'm actually taking my notes now. So if you have any idea, um, or if you want just to discuss your experience in this, uh, maybe you found your position in a different way. Yeah, uh, thank you. So if anyone wants to say something, I mean, now it's a free discussion time. So if you want to turn on your camera or just feel free to unmute yourself. Anyone you want to say something? Yeah, so if I can start with, the, uh, so I, I'm not sure, but possibly, um, it might be slightly different to you know people in different fields. For example, computer science comparing with uh, you know maths or physics in the sense that, for example, in my experience, uh, I didn't see much position in physics or in maths posts on LinkedIn. But it seems, for example, in maths or in physics, some people post on their one kind of platform they can announce new positions or some academic academic they post uh, advertisement of their own group on you know via their personal twitter account or you know something like this so i'm i'm quite actually quite curious that if there's such difference i mean for real in uh, different fields even yeah, I don't know. Sorry, um, opinion on this. Yeah, uh, I mean, as as I was searching, uh, I mainly search from uh, I'm from computer science, so uh, there were some position on uh, on LinkedIn which I found interesting, although they were uh, um, a bit, uh, let's say, difficult to to to. To, to uh, sorry, they were not really fitting my my profile, but they were not as many as uh, I found. So one would expect, uh, let's say, to actually use LinkedIn or job uh, searching websites, but uh, they were mostly about uh, internships. Perhaps uh, this is more effective for that. Uh, I'm I'm not sure about uh, differences in the field, so maybe can one someone can uh, chime in. Uh, yeah, like for my 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 the experience for myself when I apply for uh, the postdoc position, um, like the ones I I got, uh, so I so I applied uh, a few and in the end I kind of received three offers, and almost two I mean two of them I found it on on Twitter. <laughs> Uh, so because the professor who is hiring postdoc is kind of in the same community, so you know this person even before. And so I have the impression that this is a more efficient way to contact via this way because kind of you're knowing what, what he's doing and he kind of know what you're doing. And like for myself, the conversation to start with is quite informal in a sense that we just, that we just say we have a chat on this and 
see if our interests agree or uh, something like that. So uh, personally, I feel this is a more efficient way uh, if you know the, the 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 professor kind of the people you are you are applying for, okay. and there are some others like the the more well known ones in the community. They they might have their own you know website or have their own official Twitter account, so they post the um the job. But I mean, in the end, I didn't get it. Um. So I feel like in this way, you are kind of submitting the application to, uh, there's this kind of central committee that evaluates your application. Like for myself, I didn't get lucky in this, <laughs> in this way. So I'm feeling that if we have better you know, knowledge about who you're going to work with or something like that, could get a better chance. Yeah, we, we do need a bit of luck still. <laughs> we <laughs> always need that. <laughs> no, but I, I agree. I feel like that's a great uh, point in general to to use Twitter to follow those in the field. And hopefully one of their reposts will be uh, what you need. And this allows you also to, to connect directly with them and maybe inspect without waiting uh, 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 let's say like in a traditional uh, submission process where you send your CV and you forget you did it and then maybe hopefully they, they turn to you and said this is a somewhat engaging uh, process so I guess we should have it as the key takeaway yeah. and uh, oh, sorry uh, can, can I like ask you something um how like uh, how how early you started uh looking for a position like you say mm -hmm. not too early but like oh i of course i did the mistake of going too early <laughs> all right <laughs> I mean, uh, you did the post uh, where you also did the visiting so uh yes yes but the, um as you said um there was a bit of a coincidence slash overlap in the sense that uh, uh, I saw the advertisement, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I saw it around February. So I was going to finish in November. So I think it's a good six months early. The application was going to end uh, in uh, May. But uh, I made sure to contact to see if there was a chance to delay the start, which is probably I mean, the most important uh, uh, thing of my experience. So I was moving too early. The deadline was months later. So, but at least I had uh, time to, to prepare the application. Yeah. And uh, then, um, the, I, because I, I was uh, sort of making the, the the process, et cetera, early, but I started uh, later. Right. So, yeah, 